Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. A little bit later on, Kedrick Olson will be here with me. Very excited for this conversation and information. He's a paranormal expert. He also works in something I haven't done in decades, but got very excited to find out about with runes, R-U-N-E-S, the divination tool. And also he's a renowned author, speaker, teacher with over 30 years of experience helping people with their spiritual concerns. The Dare to Dream show has been nominated for Two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award listed in the Welp magazine currently as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to, and also recently won in Denver, Colorado, the Coalition of Visionary Resources Award for the best radio and podcast show. Thank you guys for helping me to get there. I've been doing this for 15 years, so it's always great to have you along for the ride. And this show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here in accessconsciousness.com. They do great energy work out into the world. You can join them at drdanehere, H-E-E-R.com or accessconsciousness.com. I'm Debbie. I teach people how to write a page turner book. I also have a company that takes that book and turns it into a guaranteed international best-selling book. And the third leg is I show you the ultimate visibility formula, how you can get booked on radio and podcasts and get massive results. And to that end, I am rolling out a challenge that I only did one other time. I don't do this often. So if you want to climb aboard, you can join the five-day challenge, how to be interviewed on podcasts five-day podcast interview challenge. You're going to learn the entire system of being interviewed. Everything from how to put your media kit together to how to get a hell yes from a show, what to do once you're on the show so you deliver an amazing conversation, and how to get massive results. If you're a light worker, and I know you are because you're here, you deserve this information. This should be in your toolbox because you came here to deliver, to deliver a piece of the puzzle of heaven here on earth during this massive ascension time, you should be interviewed on podcasts, giving out your message. Also, when you know how to do this correctly, you get new clients, you fill workshops online and in person, you sell books, your database numbers increase. This is something everyone needs. So join at debbyd.net slash challenge. It's rolling out and you'll want to be one of the lucky ones to climb aboard. And I'm so excited to teach you these skills. It's D-E-B-B-I-D dot net slash challenge. So today I'm speaking with Kadrick Olson. He's an author, speaker, teacher, and paranormal expert. His specialties include paranormal arts training, shadow work, Norse mysticism, from early childhood and throughout his life, Kadrick has led a paranormal life. Living in a haunted house full of spirits taught him how to connect with the spiritual realms. And growing up, attending a spiritualist church, he learned the art of seance and channeling. His lifetime connection with advanced beings called the Whisperers oof, gave him a keen awareness of the landscape of the afterlife and knowledge of how to work with his various entities. You can learn more about him. Just go to his first name.com. It's kadrick.com, K-A-E-D-R-I-C-H dot com. And with that, I welcome Kadrick to the Dare to Dream show. It's so great to have you. I'm really happy to be here. It's going to be great. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I want to start out with, so in your bio, it says you guide people through their supernatural and their spiritual concerns. And since you've been doing this over 30 years, Kajrik, what kind of patterns do you see with people? What kind of concerns do they come with you that is most prevalent? That's a great question because it's actually the basis of why I got into doing shadow work mm. and why I almost will say, I'm almost challenging to say, I'm not a light worker. I'm a shadow worker ah, because okay. the patterns that I've seen is people work on their spiritual growth. They work on their development and then they hit some roadblocks and then they keep pushing through those roadblocks. They keep hitting the same walls over and over again. You know, they think I'm a spiritual being. I can't be angry. I can't get upset. I can't have hurt feelings about things. And therefore, I must not be a very spiritual being if I'm still getting angry and upset or hurt feelings. 
And with shadow work, we go in and we find, well, no, actually, maybe the anger is a good thing because you're setting boundaries. You're protecting yourself. You see value for who you are and what you're doing. And maybe that shadow trait is actually that guilt and that feeling that you can't have anger and express anger and still be a spiritual being. And when we work through some of these blocks, then it's like, oh, suddenly the advance, they move up in their spiritual growth. Things start to get a little bit easier, a lot more smoother with them. Another thing that I keep seeing a lot of times in the in the realm of the paranormal world is people having problems with spirits in their house. You know, things mm. missing, disappearing, doors closing, the weird, creepy feeling, cold spots. That people are just very uncomfortable with their homes. And I go in and I help them to reconnect to the energy. To We don't cast the spirits out. We don't, you know, exercise the spirits. We don't banish them. We actually sit and have a conversation with them. Like, why are you here? Who are you? What's going on? So that we can actually have the, the people who live in that house have a shift of energy. So they're no longer afraid going, oh, what are you going to do to me? We mm. now go, oh, is there a way I can help you? And that massive shift, I call it the compassion shift, changes mm. the entire energetic dynamic of the house. All of the negativity, all of the fear-based stuff stops immediately. And we have a much better connection with people. And the biggest problem out there is a lot of the media tells us that the paranormal is scary, that the supernatural is this frightening, terrible thing when it's just a natural, normal part of our world. It's a natural part of being human. And when I help people connect with that and realize that their relationship with the spiritual beings around them improves drastically. Because this has been going on for you since you were born. You grew up in a house. I think you described it as like a portal for all sorts of beings and energies to come through. Um, tell me, what was that like? For me, that was normal. It was normal to you know be sitting alone in my room and watch something kind of move through, you know, just kind of aware of something walking through the door and just like, oh, hey, uh, watching TV, you know, back in the old days when you had to like physically die, turn the dial, <laughs> watching TV and you could actually see the dial moving while watching tv and it's just like oh come on i was watching that let's put let's change this now <laughs> coming home setting my coat down on the bed turning around to grab something off my desk or a shelf and then i go turn around to go hang my coat up again and my coat's gone <sighs> and it's just like god come on guys what are we doing here and you know it would show up in another part of the house later on and it's just like okay thank you it was what? most challenging going to sleep though because I was sleeping alone in the basement as a kid oh, and <laughs> they were so active at night. I could feel them like playing with my hair, jostling the bed. I, you know, I was super sensitive so I could feel them in the room for the first several years. I had to sleep with a TV on right next to the mm. bed because the electromagnetic distortion from the TV created a buffer space so that they couldn't mess with me. But I started learning shielding techniques. I started learning how to shift energy. I learned how to set boundaries and say, it's cool that we talk. It's cool that we can communicate and connect, just not in my room when I'm sleeping. Mm -hmm. So I learned to set those boundaries and put up the shields and the walls. And then I could finally sleep without having the TV on. And still to this day, you know, at home, I have the boundaries. I have the energy set up, but still, you know, just because it's energetic, we'll wake up in the middle of the night with some weird banging noise or some weird thing going on. And I'm like, oh, okay, it's time to do some clearing here. Time to do some energy shifting time to have a conversation with who's here and see what they need and what they want. And then it goes back to being quiet. We can get a good night's sleep again. But, so that was normal for me. And you told a story in one of your recent newsletters about seeing a fairy in, I believe it was in a bathroom. Will you tell that story? I was a really little kid. I think I was probably preschool age, you know, really young. And I was taking a bath and I had gotten done with the bath and getting dressed. And I look up to the light and the, the light over the bathroom is like a rectangle. It's like a rectangle shaped lampshade in front of the light bulbs. And as I looked up there, I'm seeing this little like elf, like fairy, like silhouette walking inside the light shade. And of course, that kind of freaked me out as a kid because I'm like, what am I doing? What is this all about? Now I grew up and I know, okay, that's just kind of like a nature spirit or a house spirit poking around and showing itself. I'm almost embarrassed now that now that I'm an adult to be kind of startled by it when I was a kid. But when I was a kid, 
I, I didn't quite know what I was seeing or what was going on. You can almost think of it the same equivalent as seeing a big bug that you have no idea what it is. And you're a kid. It's going to be like, wow, what are you, what are you doing here? And then we get to be an adult and you're like, oh, that's really cool bug. That's neat. You know, just that kind of a shift. Amazing stuff. I mean, you're so much stronger than me. I was also a very, very, very sensitive kid, but I think I shut a lot of this off when I was growing up. I was so scared as a kid. I remember at night I saw things on the wall. I mean, oh man, I, I was so scared. And it culminated when I was 16. My brother was going to Berkeley College of Music. I We grew up in New York. I flew up there to, he was an older brother. I flew up there to hang out with him. And he was living in this house and we had a great day. He showed me the room I was gonna sleep in. I went to bed and I woke up at 16 years old and I knew there was a man in that room with me and I freaked. And I remember turning around and like, you know how they do, you pray really fast. Please, 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 please. You know, if you could, if you hear me, please, please, please. Like I was just praying to God. And then at some point it dissipated, I slept. And in the morning I woke up and I told Dave and he said, oh yeah, that's the judge. And I was like, what? <laughs> and he said, yeah, there was a judge who lived in this house and he died here. And we hear weird things and you slept in his room. And I'm like, David, uh -huh. really? Like, let me know ahead of time or put me somewhere else. But I think I went click, throw away that key. Because, yeah, I, I kind of, I think had a little bit of fringe paranormal, but it was too much for me and I had no one to guide me through that. So exactly. I think it's amazing that you can help people even connect, like take the terror out of it, but instead have this connection that, I mean, so many people who are watching us right now are here because they want to be of service, right? And that's yeah. what you're doing. Absolutely. And your story is very, very common because as we're, as we're kids, little kids, all of us are tuned in, all of us are open and aware but as the years progress, we have to tune it out. We have to like lock it up, put it aside because our parents are not doing this. Our peers are not talking about it. I often say probably the worst thing to happen with a paranormal experience is not the experience itself. It's trying to find someone to talk to about it and to make sense out of it yeah. without getting the weird lashback from people. And so what you described is so common. People will have this kind of startling paranormal experience that freaks them out a little bit. They're like, Oh no, what do I do? Where do I go? Who do I talk to about this? And there's not a lot of resources for that, unfortunately. And I will say that what you experienced is a completely perfectly natural part of our world. Hmm. It's just because so much of us has tuned it out. So much of us have pushed it away and not aware of it, or we have really strong misconceptions about it that unfortunately perpetuates a lot of that fear cycle so when we see something like that, we don't know what to do. We don't know what it is. We don't know if it's going to hurt us. We don't know how to react. And that has become a big part of my mission mm. is to teach people that this is a natural part of our world. This is a normal thing. And here's what you do when you encounter a situation like that so that you can have the best effort completely with it. And by the way, you did partially some really good things with that. You know, some of the things I recommend, you know, doing that prayer, getting into a higher mind state, holding your boundaries and saying, no, mm -hmm. no, 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 this is my space right now. And that helps to dissipate the potential problem. So you did great with that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and I I want to go back to something you said earlier about shadow work. Mm -hmm. So I have done a considerable amount of shadow work, and I I think it's some of the most exquisite work. It, I think it's also difficult because we insulate ourselves so much from new, knowing the truth about ourselves. So I want you to explain to folks who are watching and listening, what is shadow work? What does that mean? For me, shadow work is going into the deep, dark, ugly, if not scary places of the psyche and the soul to no longer reject them, to no longer push them away, but to actually learn about them to make friends with them, to ally yourself with it. Because every single one of these, I'm not going to say negative emotions or negative beliefs or negative behaviors, but I'm going to say unwanted. The reason why I don't say negative is because you have those feelings, you have those behaviors, beliefs, those patterns, because they helped you at some time. At some point in your life, they were useful for you. They saved you. They got you out of whatever situation you were in. They mm -hmm. help you helped you to adapt to what was going on around you. But now that you're becoming who you are, 
they're a hindrance. They're in the way they're blocking you, which is why they're showing up, which is why they're causing such a problem because shadows always project into the world around you. That's where we look at other people and go, oh, can you believe they're doing that? Can you believe that? Or we start having this negative inner dialogue going on. Well, remember all of that helped you. All of that's useful for you. So if you try to push it away, if you try to stamp it out, if you try to stuff it down, it's going to log in harder. It's going to like lodge in deep and it's going to push back even harder. If you ignore those messages, they're going to find another way to come around and make themselves present, which is why we run into so many difficulties in our spiritual growth is because we think we have to stuff it down, push it away, ignore it, but they're going to keep coming up and coming up and coming up. But if you can look at that part of you that makes you makes you feel like maybe you're not worthy and really explore it and say, hey, what are you all about? What are you really teaching me? And you find that maybe it's protecting you, protecting you from taking risks because of that one time when you were in elementary school, you took a risk and got laughed at and you fell down and hurt your knee or something. And so nowadays you're like, oh, I'm not doing that anymore because I don't want to get hurt anymore. And you can look back and go, okay, great. That helped me when I was a kid. Now I'm an adult, I need to be able to step up and take these opportunities, even though they are scary and risky, because I am worthy. And the reason why I know I'm worthy is because I'm trying to protect myself from it. Therefore, I know I'm valuable and this is good. And so we shift that energy around inside to let the soul finally shine through and let the soul's purpose come into this world because we're, in, we're, we're moving all of that insulation. We're letting it be vulnerable and open which by the way, the key, and I work with a lot of men because I did a deep dive into pagan men's work. Awesome. The wow. secret to strength for men is being open and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And we can't do that until we get our shadow work. And then we can be open and vulnerable and say, this really hurts. How can we work together to resolve it? And once you clear those things out, which by the way, it never ends because whatever you adapt to and what's working for you now in your spiritual growth might not always, but it might be a, a hindrance or a shadow in 10 years. So spiritual evolution is always growing. And I teach people those skills to work with their shadows so that they work with their shadows. Now they do their spiritual growth five, 10 years from now, they have those skills built up so that they can work through those shadows to move to the next layer, which then they keep working on their shadow work and they're part of their growth. As long as we're growing and ascending, there's always going to be shadows. So we need to be able to work with that in some way. Do you, what do you think about the saying one finger pointing at you, three fingers pointing back at me. Because that's something I used a lot in shadow work. Most of my shadow work was around that. Like to for me to list every single place that I, anybody who pissed me off, right? Anybody who annoyed me, anybody I had complaints about and to list them specifically, what were those complaints? And then here's where the difficult thing was you know, mirror, mirror, right? What mm -hmm. I see in you actually exists in me. And it annoys yep. me about you because I have not healed it in me. So that was my shadow work. And to like, oh, that's impossible. That can't exist here. That's just them, right? So there's a lot of separation until, you know, um, I would often get myself in a state, like very vulnerable state to unearth, to go deep dive, to find out what is going on inside of me and where might I be doing that behavior out in the world and then boy once you start seeing oh with that person with that situation there's this ownership remorse um and it really evens out the playing field absolutely and I have a a, a more of a derogatory term for that but I won't mm -hmm. use it here it's a, it's a type of mirror <laughs> <You can. laughs> mirror. But it, what I do with that is if you find yourself in a situation where you're judging somebody or you're criticizing somebody or you're angry with them, stop and take a look inside. Why? What is inside you? Because it's a mirror. It's reflecting that back at you saying, great, you have this inside of you. For example, I was working with somebody who was in a band with his roommates and they, he did not get along with the way his roommates were keeping house. He'd recently got a promotion, was making more money and now he was getting more and more upset with his roommates about how they were keeping house. They were comfortable with the way they were keeping the house, but he wasn't. And he thought they were the problem. We do that shadow work. We go into it and it's like, no, no, no. I have a higher sense of what I want in the world. I want to live in a different state, a state of being. I want to live under different conditions. And now I can afford it. I feel like I deserve to live that way. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, great. 
find a new apartment, move out, move in with somebody that you are comfortable with and that you can share the same ideals for how you keep the house. He did because he was now honoring that part of him that, you know, those three fingers looking back, he was now honoring that part of him that wanted to live in different conditions that was more reflective of what he felt about himself getting a promotion and a raise. And that healed up the rift between his band members. Now they're still a band, they're playing, they're still friends, they're doing great. And he's living comfortably. Mm. But he couldn't have gotten there until he stopped blaming them, looked at himself and go, what are those three fingers telling me? What is that mirror telling me about me? And what is this good thing about me? And you're like, oh, now I'm going to honor that. And it just makes things so much better when you do that. Yeah, that's so, it's great work. It's the most healing work. It's some of the deepest work. And the fact that you work so much with men, that's heartening to me, really. And I want to get a little bit into our runes. Should I pick one for us for sure. right now? Okay. So for I'm taking Kadrix energy as well as mine, and we're going to see what it, this is for everybody, by the way, watching and listening. Are you so much of an expert, Kadrix, that you can literally tell us what this means without my looking it up? Yes. Um, oh. okay. There we go. That is now these. That is the rune of need and necessities. It's hmm. really where we get the word need from because need is another way of describing it. Uh, the way to think about this one is, you know, we need air, we need water, we need food, we need friendship and companionship in our life. And now these is that rune reminding us to tune in and that our needs are, are necessary and that it's okay to have desires and wants as well and what it feels like when we don't have them one of the things i like to help people think about is what i call the nowthies wunyo shift nowthies is all about needs and and desires and wants where wunyo is all about joy and happiness and this these two runes help us to reframe our life so let's say if somebody is working you know paycheck to paycheck and it finally comes to the end of the month, they've got all their bills paid and they've got $20. And now these mindset says, oh no, I've got $20 left in my bank. What am I going to do? A Wunyo mindset goes, oh, look, I got everything paid off and I've got $20 on top of that. That's great. So that now these is a reminder of us too, to, you know, look inward. Are your needs being fulfilled? Are your needs being met? Are you getting what you need? If not, how can you go do that? What can you do? How can you use that desire as a motivating factor to get your wound yo? Mm. So that's in essence what now these is all about. Good job. Good job. So you're a runic scholar and runes have been used for tools of transformation. The Norse used runes as tools for communication. The Vikings used them for wisdom before they went on a journey or they entered battle and you wrote a book called Runes for Transformation Using Ancient Symbols to Change Your Life. Can you give us some rune tips, techniques, applications, anything for this ancient alphabet? Sure, absolutely. The first thing to keep in mind is runes as a divination tool was invented in the 1980s. But before then, <laughs> in the old Norse times, Runes were actually tools of transformation. They saw runes as these like subtle energies that flew through, that flowed throughout all of the universe and through our minds and throughout our existence. And that's actually in the old Norse poetry. Well, we don't have to go to do much detail about that, but they knew that when they sang the runes, this is the traditional way to work with runes they is sang. singing with intention. This is like exactly like the work of Jonathan Goldman. About with a sound healing that the runes provide us the intention and the sound to sing. Now, the way I treat runes in uh, the runes for transformation book is that there are runes in the world everywhere, all around us. For example, the rune Fehu, the, the original rune, the first rune at the beginning is all about investments of time, effort, energy, money. So you think of it as a, a rune about value. And you can look at anything in this world, you know, like I've got this, this teacup here. Sure. There's the value of buying it, but there's that personal value of, of what it's, you know, doing for me, holding my tea and things could have personal value. So maybe the personal value of something outweighs its monetary value. 
But now we also have runes inside, root inside of us. There is a Fehu to you. For you, there is a certain value. And that value is your own perception. Now, the way that you'll understand what your inner runes are is look at the world around you. What do you, how do you see Fehu in the world around you? Is Fehu is value something that's fleeting and hard to get, or that you have to work really hard to get to, or does Fehu just flow to you easily, effortlessly that it comes to you? Well, that'll tell you what your Fehu is like inside. So in the book, I give you ways of building affirmations, like mantra type work with the runes with that intention. So now you can change your Fehu inside to be of a higher value to be a more of a prosperous flow. And when you change that Fehu inward, you'll start to notice the Fehu around you change. And we do the same thing like Urus is about strength and vitality. Anzus is all about communication, awareness, and understanding. Thurzas is all about your assertiveness, if not aggressiveness. Like what degree can you take it? And when we look at all 24 runes, we realize as a human being, these are spiritual qualities within all of us, even if they're the hardest of times, like Hagalaz is about natural disasters and natural disruptions. It's still a natural part of our world. And how do we work with that one? And so I te teach people how to look at those runes, how to internalize them, how to see them reflected in the world around them so that they can transform the world around them from the inside out. Hmm. Are you Viking? Do you have Norse ancestry inside well, of you? Yes, I have Norse ancestry you know, from Sweden and Denmark that sort of thing. Yes. You look like it. Like I'm, I'm obsessed with that stuff. I watch every TV show movie about Vikings. I just, I think they're amazing, frankly. I mean, they were badass. <laughs> you didn't want to mess around with them. You wanted them on your side, <laughs> but my God, they were so deeply spiritual, you know, uh, the way they operated. Ah, and I love how equal women were in that yes. society. It was quite beautiful. And they they had their own shamans. And uh, I listened to your music, by the way. Uh, so you should tell people you also, you we're talking about the runes were meant to be sung. You have albums out. I was listening to Siegfrieda's prayer quite a bit, where you're singing and speaking and chanting. Um, so tell us about that. Absolutely. This this is a form of Galder. Galder is an Old Norse word for singing the runes. Mm -hmm. And we don't know how the Old Norse really did it. That just never got documented. There's not an unbroken chain of one person teaching it to the next to the next. We can guess at how Galder was done. We can guess at it. We can put it together. And there's some really good bands out today, you know, like Vardruna and Heilong and Nutland. And, I've seen you know, Heilong in concert. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing stuff. Yeah. Well, my take on it is that there are seven vowel runes, what we can consider vowels, seven of those in Old Norse, in the runes. And I put them along the length of the spine. They match where the chakra points are. That was an intentional. They just do. And then I also attributed each one of those seven vowels to a note on the diatonic scale, major, minor, whatever. It's the seven notes of the scale for the whole octave. Knowing that, that these are vowels, knowing that these are now musical notes, I can take Old Norse prayers. I can take runic inscriptions, such as Laukas Alu, which is an ancient healing formula, and I can create music out of that because now I know what notes correspond to that one. And not only was I one of those paranormal kids, you know, grew up paranormal, but I was one of those kids that read music before words. You know, I was in piano lessons at a young age as well. And so, this runic music is, that I call Galdercraft, the, the power of rune song is basically what Galdercraft means. I pairing what I know about hypnosis, magic, runes, and music all together to create runic music. And that album that you're referring to is all like a ritual setting. So it teaches you how to set sacred space, how to call in the higher level beings into the work that you want to do. And then maybe you want to do some healing magic. There's a song for healing magic. Maybe you want to do some prosperity work. There's a song for prosperity work. So, and then there's a, a song there called Ellie Leaf Solu, which is all about closing that ritual so that it, it you were absorbing that higher energy and moving into a higher state of being. Because Ellie Leaf Solu basically means soul magic for eternal life. And, and so it's 
this whole album was designed as a ritual under that principle under that principle of modern galder work that i've invented where can people get the music if you go to my website kedrick.com and you click on the runes tab you can scroll down and it'll take you to the galder craft page where you can download the rune music easy i like it Thank yeah you. it's worth it yeah i listened to a couple of them that you had available for us to hear and i was just i was really entranced I'd be interested in hearing some of the other ones you're talking about, the magic and the prosperity and sounds delicious. And that's all on soul music, the album. It's all on soul magic. Yep. Soul magic. Okay. Yep. Beautiful. Wow. Uh, I love that. I love that. Love that. And so what do you do with all this Viking stuff that runs through your veins and fascinates you? How do you use that out in the world? That's a very important question, because when we talk about those advanced beings I've worked with, the Whisperers, for my entire life, there were quite a few years when we had some knockdown, drag out fights about the stuff they were giving me, because I basically was throwing it back at them saying, this is useless, this is nonsense, because who's going to use this? You can't take it out into the world and make something with it. And they're like, okay, fine. You know, so we, we came to an agreement that all of the information I get from them now has to have a practical benefit. It can't be like this nice, happy, great thing just to know and have it that you can just tuck away and pull it out for trivia. You've got to be able to use it. And the way I look at the old Norse culture is their spirituality was infused throughout their daily life. They they literally coexisted with the the Hulda folk, the the fairy folk, the the people of the land. They literally coexisted with their ancestors. They knew they existed in a paranormal world. They knew they were spiritual beings, and so that was an, incorporated as a big part of their world. And unfortunately, a lot of times today we separate our spiritual from the the day to day stuff. So when I have somebody come to me that says, oh, Odin is my patron or Freya is my patron or Thor is my patron. And I'm like, great. How do you honor them? And I hear, well, I've got a statue of them on my altar at home and I'll raise a horn to them and I'll leave them offerings. And I'm like, great. What else are you doing? And they're like, what do you mean? What else? And then I'll talk about what I consider sacred actions. Like if you're working with Odin, a sacred action to Odin is about teaching and leading and guiding and helping people also learning a sacred action to Thor is making sure your home is safe and protected. You know, a, a sacred action to Freya is making the world a more beautiful place and recognizing the beauty that's everywhere, sharing the love and connection and prosperity. So I'll talk to them about how can you take a sacred action in honor of that deity so that your life becomes not only a prayer to those deities, but a prayer to your higher self, because you are living your spirituality, not just doing it in a ritual setting. Because I think everything you do in ritual has to have a direct application to the physical world. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. So I work with a lot of this Norse stuff in that practical way. Like, where can you find the runes in the world? Where do you find the influence of the deities in the world? How can we work with the spirits on a day-to-day -day basis? everywhere so to me it's got to have a practical my saying is i want your head in the clouds i want your head just going off to the other dimensions but i want your feet firmly on the ground i want you rooted in place and making practical beneficial use of this stuff mm -hmm. who do you give homage to yourself and how do you take action for that in your life big time to odin you know, because I'm teaching, I'm learning. I'm never done learning. I, you know, I'm always trying to absorb stuff. I'm always learning all the time. So to me, it's that teaching, leading, I'm building online courses. I'm doing podcasts. I'm spreading this message as far and wide as I can. So Odin's big time. The Norse goddess, Hell. She's big because a lot of the work I do is with the paranormal stuff and healing spirits. And she came to me a long time ago and said, I want you to help people learn how to die. And it was because people were getting stuck going into the afterlife. They weren't crossing over very well because they get hung up on all of their issues or all of their concerns or all of their fears. And a lot of this work that I'm doing in the paranormal is help people realize there is an afterlife. Here's how you can prepare for it. Here's what you can do to get ready so that you don't have these hangups for it. So I'm honoring her in that way. And I work a lot with the Norse god Frere. And he's a lot about masculine energies, about prosperity, about peace and friendship. And so the way that I'm doing that 
is by continuously working on building this business so that I can reach more people by working with men to help work with, you know, connecting with a sacred masculine and bringing in a sacred masculine into the world, as well as fostering a, a better world of peace. You know, the, the Norse are considered, you know, very warlock, warlike, very violent. Sure. But that's how everybody was at that time of the world. We are now in a more peaceful state than ever in the entire history of humanity. And when we look at certain Norse deities like Balder and Frere, they don't fight. They were never in a warlike conflict. And I mean, even if we look at the old Norse times, when somebody went Viking, you know, Viking is just a part-time summer job. It's just a title. It's not <laughs> a, It's not a people. It's just a title. Mm -hmm. And when they went with their, their trading, when they went off Viking, right? They just did it to make enough money to become back and be a farmer. Mm -hmm. They wanted to provide for their family. And that's Frere's work as well, is that farming and that agriculture, that prosperity and home and family and peace. Mm. What do the Vikings believe about the nature of the universe? They had a, a, a very interesting, complex cosmology. There were nine worlds, everything from realms of fire and ice to different, two different realms of uh, gods to the underworlds, you know, of the, the dead and the dwarfs. It was a big, vast cosmology. But outside of that, even beyond that, beyond this world three of Yggdrasil, which is all of those nine worlds, there are even higher realms. There's bigger, higher levels of existence that fascinatingly to me is if like, if we look at all of the worlds of the tree of life compared to the, the Kabbalistic tree of life, mm -hmm. and then they'll talk about how that there is those layers of existence, so the Ein Sof, Ein Sof are that are even before the tree of life. Well, that exists in the Norse true as well. Because it talks about how that there are realms above Asgard, like Andlang and Vidblowin, that there are these even higher realms. And I'm just fascinated that their cosmology just goes that deep and that full. It's not just here, but it's there's so much beyond here. Mm -hmm. You know, you're talking about their spirituality. And I know that I may not say this right at all, but there's Norse magic. Is Seor? How you say it? Seether. Seether? Seether, yep. Oof. Okay, so Old Norse Seether. Yes. <laughs> so this is a type of magic that was uh, practiced in Norse society, late Scandinavian Iron Age. And Seether, I'm going to want to say it as much as possible without making it Spanish. Seether is, it's believed to be a magic that's related to the telling, the shaping of the future. What do you know about this magic? Yep. Sailor is a lot like shamanism, where you go into an altered state of consciousness. Mm. Usually the Seith Kona, the, the Sailor woman, would mm. be sitting on Which a, I love. A, a, a chair that's up high. Like a, I don't want to use the word high chair, but that's kind of what it is. It was a raised platform. And she would go deep into her trance with music, special songs called Vardalokar, to take her into this deep trance. And then she would be able to speak of the future it's called spow to be able to spow to be able yeah, to see the, doesn't that mean seer essentially is it seer it, it's really closely related to seething you know like when we get you know so so much energy so much emotion that we're seething mm. and so that is kind of what they would be doing you know they would almost be like you know really get into that ecstatic state when they were doing it so it seemed like they were seething and that would be a lot about how their trance came through. Uh oh. I'm with you. 100%. Okay, great. Great. No, no problem. Sorry about that. But yeah, they would basically go into an altered state. Spau is one form of it. They would also do uh, Hamarama, shape shifting. They could go in and do soul retrieval. There's even Norse stories about, say, Kona doing uh, soul retrieval. And they would also offer blessings of the deities and other spirits and ancestral people to all of these places. So see, there was multifaceted. They could do a lot of things, not just prophecy, but lots of stuff. It's interesting when you say that um, it's inception of shamanism, shamanism also uh, coming from Siberia originally, boy, that mm -hmm. word just eluded me for a second. 
And and I, I bring that up because when I was listening to your music and your voice, it had a quality of Tuvan to it. And you, you know what that is, right? Tuvin? Yes, the throat singing. Exactly. And although you were not doing the throat singing, because I'm very familiar with it, you had that almost guttural, that very low chanting that you were doing. And so it's interesting tying all of these pieces together. And so the, the women would go into this state mm -hmm. and they would be able to shamanistically foretell and uh, how often did the people, the tribes people, I guess you could call them, how did they, how much did they depend on these seethers? At least seasonally. You know, there are tales of women that would travel from village to village at certain times of the year so that they could bring their prophecies and their blessings to these villages. Some of the villages would have had a resident, say the Kona or, or Galdramather, which is the, the man who works with runes as a Galdramather. They could have been resident ones there, but Sometimes it was pretty regularly. Sometimes it was just seasonally. It, it There's no consistent stories about how often. And your Odin is connected, right, to the magic because he's the god of wisdom, divination, magic, death, war, poetry, etc. So he's he's very much in there. Indeed, Odin not only is, uh, one of his names is Galdra Father, the father of rune magic, but also he asked Freya, Lady Freya to teach him how to do Sather because she's the great teacher of Sather. So Odin knows Sather magic and Galdr magic. He's affluent in both of them. He's affluent. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's the right word. Be not just fluent, but affluent in both of them. <laughs> that's beautiful. And Viking healers, um, I believe they were called, and I want to say it properly because it's V O L, Volva. Is that the right Volva. way to say it? Say it? Yeah, Volva. Volva. Mm -hmm. So they were like the spiritual leaders, the healers in the Nordic society. Can you talk about the Volvas? The Volva and the Seidkona are basically almost the same kind of thing. They're just different mm -hmm. words for the same, but the Volva that we see, for example, in uh, the Poetic Edda, which is the, the Poetic Edda is a great resource for Norse mythos. And the very first poem is called the Voluspau which means the the oracle of the vulva, Shpau being prophecy. And Odin basically commits a form of necromancy to raise the vulva from her grave wow. so that she can tell him things that have happened in the past, things that are happening right now, and things that are going to go on to the future all the way up to Ragnarok, the end of the world. Yep. So a vulva is more of a, a Shpau Kona, more of a prophecy woman. But it's the same kind of thing. She is definitely a religious leader, very highly respected and feared. But yeah, just another another magic user. Mm -hmm. Have you had past lives, you think, in all of this? Yeah, I'm certain that there were a couple of Norse lifetimes. Definitely one that was a little bit more violent and brutal, but it was needed for my spiritual growth in this time period. Mm -hmm. And there was definitely one that was more mystical, more magical that felt like it was a lot longer of a lifetime where I did a lot more work in there. So I know there's at least two. I hope you really go there. Like at least at Halloween, if not times during the year where you do your beard and you put beads and bones and stuff in it. Like you have, you have the look of the oh, Viking. There's something interesting coming out soon where I'll be able to definitely get more into that. Absolutely. I've All got right. some new work that I'm going to be bringing forward where I'll be able to do that. All right. Send me pictures. <laughs> you got it. That's awesome. <laughs> it's all on the back shelf behind me. You can't quite see it, but I've got some really fun stuff back there to get into that role. All right. I love it. Yep. Yeah. I see it already. So let's, let's shift a little bit back to shadow slash paranormal. Um, so unresolved shadows. So if we have stuff, and maybe you can give some examples, but I think you've already have pretty good examples, people who have a lot of anger, resentment, uh, whatever that is being repressed and not expressed. If it is unresolved as a shadow, can it have paranormal consequences? Yes, actually, I see that quite a bit too. And I might be doing a variation of my current shadow course to include paranormal the reason being is when we get an attachment, like a spirit wants to attach to us, 
it's attaching only because there is some sort of an energetic agreement. Mm -hmm. It's finding a homogenous energy within our energy fields. And that agreement is not conscious. It's not logical. We're not saying, yes, you can attach to me and suck this energy out of me. But maybe just maybe somebody who is overworked themselves or exhausted, they're just pushing themselves too hard. Their inner world is saying, I need a break. I need to shut down. I need a break. And they're desperate for that. So they've got this energetic anchor point of stopping. Now they're going to get a spirit that attaches to them that let's say is just like lazy and complacent and compliant. And they're now sharing this energy back and forth. And so this person suddenly is like, oh, I just don't feel like doing anything. I'm not motivated to do this or not going anywhere. Okay. And they're sitting there wondering, okay, I've got this work I need to do, but I'm not doing it. I'm just here. And it's like, okay, now we'll do our shadow work and we'll go in and we'll see that there's this entity attached and sure we can clear the entity away, but if we don't go and deal with that energetic anchor point, it will come back or another one will come in. And we'll go in and like, okay, what is this energetic anchor point? What's the feeling of it? What's the message of it? What does that part of your body want to tell you? And it's like, I need a break. I need a rest. And we go, great, because your rest is important. It's vital. And I will work with them to schedule rest time and downtime for themselves, help them realize by taking a break more often, it makes them more productive, even though they don't realize it, have them experiment and play with it. And then they'll find out they take their break. They have their rest. They're more productive. Suddenly we cleared that shadow out. They're no longer having a paranormal problem. Another paranormal problem that comes up is what we call the poltergeist effect. It's not, not a, an actual entity, but it's somebody living in a house where things might be flying around. They get like the creepy cold spots and the bad smells. Maybe somebody's getting scratched or being hurt. Now we'll find the poltergeist effect usually happens from adolescence. And oh statistically speaking, adolescent women adolescent girls the reason being is they are open they're aware they might be perceiving a spirit in the house they might have some emotional needs that aren't getting met and mom and dad will be going no just shut up go to your room i don't want to hear about this just stop it i don't want to hear this they can't express their emotion they're not mm -hmm. getting the freedom to express their emotion and i have seen this with adults i've actually mm -hmm. seen grown adults who were you know very scientific minded very science but yet they're seeing something paranormal in the house and they're going, mm, no, that's not real. It's not happening. They're suppressing that fear. They're pushing it down. And now they're having paranormal problems, poltergeist effect. So we'll go in, we'll find out what the emotions aren't that why they're not being expressing their emotion, what those emotions are, find a healthy way to express those emotions, find a healthy way to talk about it, release it, let those things out, feel comfortable and safe doing that. And all of that poltergeist effect just disappears instantly because it doesn't need to find an outlet anymore. It now has a healthy outlet for it. Isn't that also true that there can be attachments, entities, things that come into the house or a being, let's say there's a lot of arguments going on within a house. It's very attractive to those beings. Or if people lived here before you moved into a place and who knows what kind of bad behavior was going on, it may have attracted energies. And then how do you clear that out? Yep. That's absolutely true. Whenever we are in a persistent emotional state, we can be creating entities called a thought form. Mm -hmm. And this thought form is nothing but that emotional energy. It has no thought has no, you know, has no thinking capacity to it, mm. but it will poke us with that energy to get us to feel fear or to feel upset or to get angry so that it feeds itself. And it's not negative. It's not evil. It's just a function of our spiritual reality. And so if you have a home where there's this constant arguing going on and fighting, we're going to create a thought form that's going to perpetuate that, or we're going to draw in some type of egregore or other type of created entity that's going to try to perpetuate that argumentative state. Same way with the energy that's there. There might be an egregore or thought form lingering from the people who are there, and now it's going to poke you with argumentative energy. And you're going to, if you don't realize that this is an external source poking you, you think you're generating it. You think you're justified in the way you feel. So therefore, hey, I'm going to I'm gonna, you know, get into it. And how I help people is we do some shadow work. Why are you feeling so argumentative? Why are the, what's going on with this? these argumentative feelings? There's aggression going on. And then we'll go inside. And if there's nothing, there's nothing really there, we can look at the energy around. Of course, I'm going to scan the energy and feel the energy. And I'll tell you there's something here. But it comes from that internal shift. 
always the external world is a reflection of our internal world and the external world reinforces the internal world. So if we start shifting our internal world going, oh, that's the thought form poking me again. I'm not really feeling like arguing. And then you shift your energy into the state that you want to be like clear-minded and thinking. I help people to reactivate their prefrontal cortex because when you're in an aggressive state, it's all, all of your blood and electrical activity in the brain is going to the brain stem and the limbic system. So I've got some exercises to help you activate the prefrontal cortex so you can think about what you're doing, the consequences of what you're going to do and what action you'd rather do. And that in an essence shifts that energy, starves off the thought form and lets you take back your home so that you don't have to be under its influence anymore. Yeah. I, you know, folks might want to download your fee, free booklet from your website at kdrick.com. I did. And I'd like you to talk about that a little bit. I know things from other people who have guided me throughout life. I know things like there are very particular resins or incense or oils that can be used, scrubs and so forth. Could you talk about some of the ways we can clear our energy, known or unknown, whether we, I think it's a good time to be clearing energy on this planet. Absolutely. If I were to go to some resins or if I were to use an incense, mm. straight up dragon's blood is like, yep. just straight up dragon's blood is like a sandblaster for energy. <laughs> I can feel it just clear a room out like mm. it's nobody's business. It's gone. Or if you want to make a combination of like some sandalwood or sandalwood oil, frankincense, mirror, that helps to raise the energy of a room mm. to help. But I would still rather you take a moment to sort of meditate, to relax, to center and focus your, your mind. And I'll I even have a meditation to guide people to do this. But then you connect to what your sense of sacred is, what sacred mm -hmm. feels like to you. And it's unique for everybody. Everyone has their own sense of what sacred is. And you remember that the sacred feeling is like an energy and energy flows where your attention goes. So if you were to have that sacred connection and you were to think about your head, bring your attention to your head, that would fill and surround your head, clearing out any negativity from your head, guiding your thoughts, your awareness. You can bring it to your heart center. You could bring it into the abdomen, to the dantian, to the power center there. You can do it so that it fills and surrounds your body and being. Mm -hmm. You could do it so that it fills the space around you. Just hold on to that feeling of that sacred connection. And let every breath you take bring in more of that sacred energy. Every breath you expel fills that room so it becomes stronger and brighter, more full of that sacred energy. And that pushes entities, negativity away. And it moves you to a more sacred space internally, sacred space externally. And if there was something there that was negative, it's not there anymore. And shadow work, does it help? With, well, it helps the being grow. How does it help with spiritual growth? How does it actually uh, navigate or put us more deeply on the path of spirit? Because the soul, our higher being, came into this world with a purpose. It came here with an intention. It came here with its own authentic nature, with its own energy that it resonates with. But the family, the communities, the societies that we grew up in, we had to adapt to fit into those. And a lot of times for a lot of people, those societies and those communities are not conducive to who we are at the authentic level. And so we build up these layers of behaviors and thoughts and beliefs and feelings to adapt and to fit into that, which stops our spiritual growth. It stops who we are authentically. We do that shadow work. We clear those things out. We let go of that false identity of who we thought we had to be, who we thought we were supposed to be to fit in. And now you shine authentically with who you are. And when you do that, what's interesting to happen is you start drawing to you the people and the situations and the things that are in resonance with who you are authentically. And that creates this pattern of, uh, basically constructive interference where your positivity reinforces their positivity and you start building and growing together. Now your soul is living its purpose. Now your soul is doing what it came here to do so that it can advance and grow and ascend on that path that it came here to do where all that shadow that you picked up over the years is encumbering you. It's holding you down and it's not letting you live that fulfilling life. And there's somebody you talk about who's the dark goddess. 
Mm. Who is she and how does she fit into all of this? I got into the dark goddess work because working with a lot of men and a lot of the guys that I worked with have been overseas in the military Mm. and they tell me about the dark goddess that shows up with them. Or if these guys have had some pretty traumatic stuff going on, the dark goddess shows up for them. And she shows up in many different forms. Sometimes it's Kali. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's Hecate. Sometimes it's Lilith. Sometimes it's hell. You know, we're working with the Norse. Sometimes it shows up as hell. And they're pretty scared. They're pretty frightened by her showing up and the work that she's doing because they're like, why? What is this entity? She's scary. She's dark. She's- you mean they literally have a vision and they see a dark goddess. You betcha. And they, they interact. You betcha. And they don't understand what she's there for, why she's there. And it's scaring the heck out of them. And then I remind them, wait, this is a goddess. She's nurturing. She's caring. She Mm -hmm. wants for your benefit and your Mm -hmm. growth, but she's a bit of a butt kicker. She's going to call you into your deeper, dark places to look at those things that you don't want to see so that you can draw strength through them. So you can bring light to them so that you can grow through them. She wants to take those negative, dark things away from you, but it's not going to happen until you acknowledge it, until you work with it. And so I will guide people to work with a dark goddess. And Sometimes it's women, but I have to admit, it's overwhelmingly been men who are working with this dark goddess. So I've been really working more and more and in incorporating her work into a lot of the practices we're doing with the shadow stuff, because she's just so beneficial in all of her faces, so many ways. And so these men that you work with and they confess this to you, you help them make peace and connection with her? Absolutely. And get to the bottom of what this is, this message is, so it can be resolved. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah, I'll have them put together an altar space for her, leave offerings for her, do meditations with her, have this, you know, one on one Mm -hmm. consult with her. You know, I teach them how to go into a meditative state so that they can go to a place and actually have a dialogue say, Hey, what are you? What are you doing here? What do we need to do? And we'll work together to find out how this dark goddess can help them in their healing process. And she's phenomenal about it, but mind you, she's a butt kicker. She's scary when she does it, but it's amazing work that needs to happen. So she's not there to harm. She's there to get attention and she does it in an arresting way. So people, (laughs) sounds like most people run for the hills, but if they work with you, you help them to work through what's actually going on to get access because there's good information there for their spiritual growth. Exactly. And being a shadow worker, I'm seeing kind of like the other side of some of these things like goddess, gods and goddesses, dark goddess, even higher self that doesn't quite sort of fit into the new age narrative. Mm -hmm. Like higher self can actually be a jerk. Mm-hmm. As, as part of my shadow course, we talk about the dark night of the soul when everything in your life goes to heck and it just falls apart. More often than not, that's because higher self got involved and said, okay, this isn't working anymore. Hit the reset bucket button, make everything fall apart. And I've actually come to a new model of how to work with higher self because higher self exists in a timeless state. We, we live in a linear state where, you know, one plus one equals two, we have to follow a line you know, cause and effect, that sort of thing. Higher self doesn't. Higher self exists in a completely timeless state. But there are times when we're on a roller coaster and we're coming up on that first big hill, the big scary hill, right? And we're holding on for dear life and we're wondering about why am I here? Did I make all the right choices? Can I go back? I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I'm not here. Please stop, 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 stop. Meanwhile, higher self is back at the deck, the beginning and the end of the ride going, yeah, that was great. A lot of fun. Let's do it again. (laughs) We're stuck at that top of the hill going, no. That's hilarious. So I help people connect with that aspect of higher self going, what are you doing? Why are we doing this? Why do we have to go through this so that they get the lessons for it and then they can have fun Mm -hmm. with a roller coaster ride. And I can actually use that model of the roller coaster to help people navigate through some of the most turbulent parts of their life, Mm. realizing that this is higher self guiding you through it rather than things falling apart. This is higher self saying, this is going to be fun and experience, even though things are going to go to heck, and this is going to be a little bit challenging and hairy, but have fun with it and experience it for what you're going to get out of it. And when you come with that point of view, it's like, yeah, all this turbulence I'm going through life. That was a heck of a fun ride. I don't want to do it again, but that was fun. Yeah. 
because inherently six months, a year down the road, you are completely different when you take it on, right? You don't run away from it. Your everything will be changed in the moment. It sucks. But when you get past it, you're like, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. And I so appreciate the reframe you just gave that because I'm even taking it globally thinking about your example, about what we all go through at multiple times in our life. Think about the planet right now and humanity when most people are saying, oh, this is terrible. And I, I have a healer, a very dear friend of mine, he's hilarious. And he's always talking about politics. And did you hear that this is going on? I don't want to mention all the countries, but he's so in the news. And I'm like, dude, you know, it's coming up to be healed. Honestly, it looks horrible. I get it. But the underbelly is showing because if it doesn't show, nobody can have a response to it to make it different. And so I feel like, Kedrick, when you just reframe that, that dark night of the soul, when everything goes to shit for people and you're just like powerless, hopeless, why me, why me? This is so awful. But, you know, you pick up, you work with people like you, you get to the other side, you're Humpty Dumpty gets put back together again and you're better than ever. You learned what you needed to learn, became who you needed to become. And I feel like that is such an amazing message that you're giving for the planet right now, that it's going to be, is a dark night of the soul in some aspects, right? For what's coming up. Absolutely weird. We're definitely going through a collective dark night of the soul process right now, which is all about learning those higher lessons. And once we learn those higher lessons collectively, we don't have to do them again unless we don't learn it. And then we'll we'll go through it again, but we're doing that. And, you know, really, if we look statistically, despite some of the things that are in the news, and there's always going to be little spikes here or there, we are definitely in a most prosperous time in human history. Mm -hmm. We are definitely in the most peaceful time in human history, and it's continuing to become more so. And I will directly attribute that to everybody doing their spiritual work. You know, as you do your work for you individually, as you're doing your shadow work for you individually, it's okay because you're inserting that information into the collective unconscious, making it easier for another person to do that work. And as they do that work for them, it makes it easier for everybody else. You know, I don't know why this is coming up while you're saying that, but I know in indigenous cultures, you know, ancient, 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 uh, there's been science done about how ancient things like ayahuasca and yahe, et cetera, are these plant medicines. And of course it is making its way into mainstream. And the shamans used to predict, like the Peruvian shamans used to predict that it would be the Westerners who would become the shamans. Dr. Alberto Veloto talks about this, that we would be the ones, not our children, not the young ones being born, but we would be the ones who are here for these lessons. So. Is, was there anything in the Norse culture? Because I feel like I, I've seen this in TV or movies where they drank something that was transformative to them. So they had these incredible experiences, of, you know, beyond psychedelic, but of the soul. Absolutely. Most notably, either Liberty Cat Mushrooms or Amanita Muscaria uh, Fly Agaric. You know, those were the two primary mushrooms that they would use for that. But they also had access to wormwood and mugwort and a lot of the quote unquote flying ointments. They had access to those kind of materials. So definitely. Mm. And and there were secrets at the heart of Norse mythology. Can you uncover just a couple of them and share, please? Sure. The best ways that we're going to find these secrets is if we go to the actual Old Norse, like Old Norse poetry, because we have to remember that the Eddas and the sagas, everything that was written down from the Old Norse was written down at least in the 1300s at the earliest by Christian bishops. And in order to write these things down, they selectively chose what they would write down and then they altered it so that it was a little more acceptable to the Christian mentality of the time Mm. period. We have absolutely nothing but rune stones from the old Norse era, and they don't really tell us much. So we have to remember that the information we do have is not that great. However, the secrets were encoded in the language, Mm -hmm. in the actual language when we get deep into there. So when we go through the poetic Edda, 
we see constant references to sound and to vibration and to singing. So the old Norse knew that the world was a vibratory place. They knew that sound and vibration had harmonics and resonance to cause things to shift. And they knew that if they got into that, that vibe, that they could shift their inner world and the outer world, and that could be reflected in song. They knew that. And runes are a great example of that because there's a, all over the Eddas talking about singing the runes. Don Kanak Gel, then I know what to sing, for example. And the, the poetic Edda tells us when Odin is hanging on Yggdrasil, the world tree, to discover the runes, he talks about runes coming from a time before time in a place before things existed where they were shaped by the high holy rulers, the gods before the gods, and that they were sung by the Fimblethuler, the great singer. So it tells us that runes are this vibration that exists before there's light, you know, because when our world came into existence, that's when we get light and matter and form and sound, but runes existed in a place where that didn't happen. So it still tells us that consciousness is a vibration of sorts, of a, a vibratory essence, and that their whole, not at the overt level, not at the day-to-day -day level, but those people who knew the secrets knew that consciousness was that vibratory connection to the world around us. And so those are some of the deeper secrets that come out of the lore that we can only find through careful translation with a mystical mindset. Ooh, as somebody who's a singer myself, that is really like goosebumps to hear you say all of that. You know, such an inception that, and where were they? So if they were before there was sound and there was before light and all of that, where, what kind of matter were they and where were they? There's, there's only metaphorical hints to this. Of course, they call it gin unga gap. Gin meaning great and sacred, unga being young, gap, gap, right? It's just that gaping nothingness that's out there. Uh, this is what I would correlate to what the, the, the Kabbalistic tradition calls Ein, Ein Sof. You know, there's the limitless, there's the limitless light, Ein Sof R, that those are these layers of existence that exist before existence that we can't comprehend having our linear mind that we have because we have the mind that wants everything to fit into nice little boxes that we can understand that has to be linear this is a place where we can't understand there's no time there's no space physics doesn't work the way it does here there's no light mm. but that doesn't mean it's it is a place of darkness but it's not dark darkness you know it's just a place of consciousness the best way i can correlate this and have you think about this is imagine that there's an existence that is nothing but pure consciousness, pure infinite consciousness. Maybe this is 12th density, not just ninth density, but 12th density, just pure overlapping consciousness. And when this consciousness can focus its energy, it can condense that energy into what we would call spiritual essence. Mm. And that spiritual essence, that spiritual light can then condense into what we call electromagnetic light. And that electromagnetic light can then further condense into physical world. And so that's our connection to this ginnic layer of reality, to this time before time, is it's just a condensation of source, of source energy. So we are all spiritual, physical, source, everything. And that's what's kind of hinted at in Norse lore. Amazing. Kajic. You're going to be speaking at the Conscious Life Expo. Indeed. It's February 10th through the 13th, 2023. I will be there. That's and awesome. folks can register live or live stream from anywhere in the world. I will have the link in the show notes so you can get your tickets. I highly recommend you do. If you're enjoying Kadrick, you can get to see him in person. Tell us what you're going to be talking about. Are you going to be on a bunch of panels? You're doing workshops. You'll probably have a booth. Tell us all about that. Yep. I'm doing a panel on divination and I'm definitely going to be talking about runes as a, not just as a divination tool, but in the way that I work with runes now is I teach people how to use runes as a means for communicating with spirits because it helps you to tune in your intuition. 
And I'm doing a workshop. I'm really excited about this workshop. It's basically higher self activation through shadow work. And I'm going to give you some practical real world examples that you can use some hands-on techniques for doing shadow work to get yourself out of the way so that you can actually not only communicate with higher self, but become the living embodiment of your higher being and recognize when a shadow gets in the way so you can let that go and start living that higher fulfilling life that you were meant to do. Mm -hmm. Well, this is Dare to Dream. What are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Ah, I'm always creating online courses and I'm always trying to build and reach more people. So that's that's my big step right now is I've got a bunch of online courses like at, at kdrick.teachable.com. Uh, one of those is big shadow work. I've got a new course on there about how to do seance, but I'm going to keep building these courses and I'm going to keep getting that message out there. And so my dream really is to keep teaching to reach more people, go to more conferences, more conventions and keep teaching. And that that's really, it is just, how do I reach more people to share this message? That's, that's where I'm daring to dream. Beautiful. And you know, when we were just about to start the show, you and I, you said something about star seeds. And I just feel like that's where I want to end up. What, what is your message right now for all of us about star seeds? Oh, wow, it's a complex one that they are here, that there are beings definitely. And here's, here's what's kind of the whisper coming through the whisper that's coming through. And it's going to be from my unique shadow work potential. Remember if star seeds came to this world to help in today's world, because this is when humanity is shifting and making this big shift. But if you were these higher level entities and you were these high level beings, you have to down res from seventh density, ninth density, whatever it is, sixth density, to get into this third density. And in order to do that, you had to have some lifetimes that may not have been the greatest, but you had to do that so that you could down res in a past time where that was acceptable behavior, right? Norse, all the things that was an acceptable behavior at one period. So you may have had some of these lifetimes that were be disparaging to who you are now, but I want you to have some grace for yourself. I want you to have some care and knowing that you did that as a personal sacrifice so that you can be here today to share your message and not cling on to who you were and what you did then, because that was a necessary part of your growth to be here to help everybody else on this planet today. Wow. You're all about evolution on so many different levels. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. You're so welcome. And thank you for having me. This has been really wonderful. Amazing. Yeah. I end today's show with this quote from Charles DeLint. I want to be magic. I want to touch the heart of the world and make it smile. I want to be a friend of elves and live in a tree or under a hill. I want to marry a moonbeam and hear the stars sing. I don't want to pretend at magic anymore. I want to be magic. Tune in to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. Next week on the show, I'm featuring Emmanuel Dagger with a background in parapsychology, holistic, and alternative healing therapies. Emmanuel was highly developed intuitive and has healing gifts. I can't wait. He uses quantum healing. He is so young and so powerful. And I've known about him for a while and it's about time he comes on the show. Thanks folks. Remember, subscribe to the show, leave a comment. I read them all. And thank you for coming on the show. And remember all the tips and tools that Kedrick gave you today. Find the Conscious Life Expo link and definitely attend. You will be so grateful for the three to four days that you spend there ingesting all of these amazing people and information. Don't just dare to dream, dare to make all your dreams into your reality.